The specimens were then preserved by different means to allow them to be used for display or in the reference collection. Um, these were then treated usually with arsenic soap at the time, and yet only just over 550 species or spe sorry, specimens uh, which were collected prior to 1800 are still present in that museum. Uh, so very few of these animals that were collected for these museums have survived to today. Light sensitive materials to capture an image was developed in the early 19th century. And it was initially limited by the size of the cameras and the time required for the actual exposure. And Joseph Philibert Giraud de Pangy took the first known photograph of a living animal in 1842. There's a reproduction of the daguerreotype that was used for it. It's a, a different form of photography from the photography that we know today. But as the discipline evolved, people started sensing its potential and its application as a tool in science. And by 1884, it had already been in use, photography had already been in use um, for some 10 years in the Department of Anatomy in Cornell University, for example. Digital photography, however, came much later, although maybe not as late as some of us think. It began to be developed in the last quarter of the 20th century, and the first digital cameras only came onto the market in the 1990s. However, digital photography is provided readily accessible, uh, proved, sorry, to be readily accessible, and it's a very cheap method of recording images. Um, today, I'll consider, let me just, um, I'll consider the traditional collection of specimens for museum collections and I'll examine to what degree digital photography can become a 21st century alternative to the collection of biological specimens. To try to answer these questions, I will focus on a case study of the Gibraltar National Museum and the procedures adopted in the institution today, where the use of digital photography has taken a prominent role in its Department of Natural History since 2002. Now, for those of you who are watching online and you're not, you may not be aware what Gibraltar is, uh, Gibraltar is a tiny limestone peninsula that rises 426 meters from the Alboran Sea in the Western Mediterranean. And the Strait of Gibraltar is 21 kilometers at its, at Gibraltar, wide at Gibraltar and only 14 kilometers wide at its natural, narrowest point. And this makes the Strait of Gibraltar an important migratory bottleneck as many birds head towards this narrow gap on their way to and from Europe in their annual migrations to avoid long sea crossings. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because this has had an effect on uh, Gibraltar's position, its geopolitical position as a British colony and now a British overseas territory was largely responsible for its importance as a base for naturalists in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Gibraltar National Museum, which opened in 1930, houses both the cultural and natural history collections of Gibraltar and has become the repository of books, field notes, and collections of some of these naturalists. The museum is also the repository of all the material from archaeological excavations that have taken place in Gibraltar and particularly in the course of the Gibraltar Caves project. And this material includes tens of thousands of bird bones from Pleistocene deposits. And it's for this reason, these reasons that I have the high regional avian biodiversity, some of the best Pleistocene bird collections in the world, and a historical tradition of specimen collecting going back to the 18th century, that I will focus mainly on the use of digital photography, but in the context of bird collections. That doesn't mean that it, then the same arguments aren't applicable to other collections. And we can discuss that later. One of these naturalists that I mentioned of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century was Colonel Willoughby Cole Werner. Many still find him, even today, an amazing, energetic, and inspiring naturalist. This photograph, uh, incidentally, was taken in Gibraltar in 1903 by Sarah Angelina Acklands, who was visiting her brother, Admiral Ackland, at the time. 
Incidentally, Sarah Ackland was a pioneer of color photography. And although this is a digital color composite of three black and white color separation photographs of Werner taken by Ackland, um, they've been put together and they show you the uh, effects on the, uh, how advanced the process of color photography was even then. And I'll talk about Werner a little bit later in my presentation. The traditional collection of specimens, what's happened there? Sorry. Okay, sorry, bear with me, there's something wrong with that slide. The traditional collection of specimens in the 18th, 19th and 20th century involved the shooting of birds or the collection of eggs from their nests. And our collections also include a 19th century botanical collection, small collections of bird skins, some mounted specimens of local birds and mammals, and a recently acquired collection of mounted birds compiled in the 1960s, which was donated to the museum in 2014, as well as a 19th century egg collection. And these practices have fortunately now become virtually obsolete, but specimens from road kills and other natural deaths are still taken and added to museum, the museum collection. Over the years, as research into animals shifted beyond the collection of specimens, researchers considered issues such as disturbance and the effects of their observations might have on the survival of their subject. And it's led to the development of photography as a tool for research. The Gibraltar National Museum's policy not to take uh, specimens other than road kills and... Yeah, I know there's a, there's a fault. Ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> other than road kills or those found dead was implemented in 1991. And since then, what we did was we put two alternatives into practice. One was the field collection of data and two was the collection of photographs of birds in their habitat as far as possible. And um, other nature photographs, of course, were included, but today I'm just concentrating on the, on the birds. Um, one of, one um, important source of specimens, as I said, was uh, collecting through naturally occurring deaths. And as the migrating birds of prey come through, sometimes they're driven into the sea by the uh, local population of yellow-legged gulls, and they're driven into the sea where they drown. Um, sometimes some of them are rescued, and those that um, unfortunately don't survive are then handed into the museum where they are frozen uh, to be used for various purposes, either in experimental purposes. For example, here you can see um, work being done by taphonomists who are trying to reproduce some of the cut marks that we find in uh, some of the bones in the caves at the back of the rock which are being studied. And I, I know Stuart is going to be talking about that later, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, but the, we, what we try to do as far as possible is to make sure that those um, specimens don't go to waste. But these are examples of chance finds of specimens and in contrast to the systematic practice of specimen collection, which dominated the world of museum collections um, for centuries. Data collection has successfully continued until today in the form of species observations related to behavior and ecology. The photographic component proceeded at a relatively slow pace at first compared to today because the equipment used was at the time 35, mm, millim, sorry, 35 millimeter SLR cameras with film, typically slides, and the high cost of this was limiting factor. The Gibraltar National Museum purchased its first digital SLR camera, not this one, it's just I thought it was a fun picture, um, in 2002, and this provided a major breakthrough. Since then, the time, the growth, since that time, sorry, the growth of the museum photographic collection has risen dramatically, and this collection is now in the order of 300,000 photographs and growing. The major elements leading to the almost exponential rise since 2002 are, one, the improvement in the quality of cameras via the Nikon D2, the D3, the D4, and now the D5 model ranges, and two, a concomitant increase in the speed and storage capacity of memory cards. The Nikon D4 and D5 use the XQD cards, for example. The first known photograph is 
to have been ever taken is known as to be, a, a, or is referred to as being a heliograph. And this was taken in 1826 by Joseph Nisafor Niespes from an upstairs window in his estate in Burgundy. You can just about make out um, the, the outline of the top of the, the buildings. Um, this was a process which used bitumen of Judea coated onto a piece of glass or metal and the bitumen hardened in proportion to the amount of light that hit it. Um, the first publicly available photographs were daguerreotypes, which I referred to earlier, and these were developed in the 1830s. As other innovations were introduced, photography was soon being used as a method of recording images, and not just of landscapes and portraits impressed by nature, as they used to refer to it. Their potential for, as a use uh, as a scientific tool for the instrument chronicles everything that it sees, was soon recognized so that by the 1870s, photographs were regularly being taken to illustrate scientific works. And by the turn of the 20th century, photography was already being used in the study of ecology. The earliest reliably dated photograph of people um, is this picture that you've got on the screen. It's a view of the Boulevard du Temple, which was taken by Daguerre himself one spring morning in 1838 from the window of where he lived and worked. Now, it was taken at 8 o'clock in the morning. In fact, that's the title of the slide. Um, and it was a busy road, but because the exposure took so long, uh, the only thing that you or the only living beings that you can see are the uh, figures that are inside the red circle. So this is known to have been um, the first picture of be people. The boot, boot black and his customer were obviously sitting still long enough to uh, be visible in the, in the photograph. At first, it was the size and the portability of cameras and the time required to develop the exposed film to produce the images that were the greatest limitations. Obviously, wildlife, you can't stop it to, so that you can take a picture of it. Um, as was the cost of the instruments, that was quite limiting as well. But it didn't deter the, the popularity of photography and it, it took on, um, I think, the novelty of it in particular meant that it, it took on very quickly. And soon photographers such as Samuel Bourne in the 1860s were taking to their cameras to places which just a few years before they would never have considered doing, which is like on expeditions to Mount Everest, for example, and other remote areas. Although glass plates have continued to be used even for today, in the present day, for specialist purposes, cameras became more practical and much less cumbersome with the introduction of film. And these, this became available as from the mid-1880s. This was soon followed in 1891 by the marketing of cameras that could be loaded outside the darkroom by roll film in 1898 and the production of the safer cellulate, sorry, celluloid acetate film in 1908. The use of cameras in scientific research continued, and nature photography developed as a method of recording animals in their natural surroundings. At first, um, the first, um, shall we say, marketed camera readily available was this 1839 um, um, model. And the, the second photograph that you can see on the right of your screen is, is a studio camera used in the late, in, late 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, they were already um, using these cassettes with film so that they could be loaded without having to go into a dark room. And by 1910, and this is an important um, development, the cameras became very portable. And this photograph, I've included it because it's the first uh, photograph that was successfully taken of a solar eclipse. And that was in 1851. It strikes me how early on these, uh, this method, this revolutionary new method of recording sites was being developed for scientific use. As time progressed, and in the field of ornithology, 
Concerns about the disturbance, which I mentioned earlier, and the resulting modifications to their behavior caused by the researcher led to the development of remotely triggered cameras in the hope that by, not, by the photographer not actually being present, they would not be affecting the behavior, the natural behavior of the animal. Um, and by the 1960s, several works had already been uh, experimented on the use of film cameras as well as still cameras, um, and time-lapse photography started to be used. Um, in his paper, or in their paper, um, they state, for these reasons, Wellers started in 1963 to develop a time-lapse 8mm movie camera for recording events at nests. Problems with the timing devices reduced the quality and reliability of the results. A timer eventually was built incorporating a mechanical automobile clock, which would electrically, about, about every two and a half minutes, take the photograph. The winding device was that was used was an electrical contact to activate a solenoid on the single frame socket of a Nicorex Zoom 8mm movie camera. But the flexibility of these setups was limited and the costs involved were astronomical. And it required very, very careful planning uh, and the calculation of the exposures um, using light meters, taking into account the aperture of the lens um, and the distance from the subject in the film and the film speed. All these things had to be taken into consideration. And for us who are used nowadays to taking a photograph with our phones, for example, and immediately seeing the result of your photograph, uh, it's difficult to understand that these people were working, literally working in the dark. They would set up their experiments, they would take the photographs, but they would only see their results days, if not weeks, afterwards. So once the film was exposed, it needed to be taken for developing in a dark room. And this was either done by the photographer themselves, and a lot of photographers did develop their own photographs, or at commercial chemists. But there was a delay, as we've mentioned, in the time that the photograph was taken and, that, and the moment when the results were seen by the photographer. So there's no, um, it was impossible to tweak your setup. You just had to, to go with it. Um, and as a result, it was common to have all, all your photographs discarded because something was wrong with the, with the photographs that had been taken. So the implications of working out in the field where conditions can't easily be repeated would have result, resulted in the loss of very valuable data. Now, spools containing larger uh, lengths of film could be obtained, but the usual number of photographs that could be taken before having to change your, your spool was either 24 or 36 exposures. Just think about that today, the mind boggles. The researcher therefore had yet another consideration to take into account, which was to calculate when the optimal time to change um, films was, so as not to miss a vital uh, shot. And I can tell you from personal experience, you, you were sort of like in two minds, do I waste the next three pictures but put in a new cartridge and I'm ready, or do I just see if I can not waste them because they're expensive? And sometimes the, the dilemma was resulted in, in frustrated results. Um, a second loaded camera was an option, of course, and an assistant on standby as well, but this is clumsy in, in the world of wildlife photography, to say the least. And then there was the issue of running costs. Uh, color film had, to, had been considerably more expensive than black and white film, and it wasn't, the resolution wasn't as good. It was far more grainy, and the colors weren't true. Um, so, and also, most of the time, although there were still some photographers who could uh, and did uh, develop their own color photographs, but more often than not, they sent them to commercial chemists, so that was an added cost. Um, and because the color film wasn't as sensitive, it required external light sources. So you needed to have a flash, except in really ultimate uh, um, light conditions. Um, so by the time that the technology and the, the science of color photography advanced sufficiently, was towards the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, this was almost too late because by then, it coincided 
with the beginning, the advent of uh, the arrival of, of the digital camera. Um, the concept for a digital camera began to be developed in the late 1950s and in the 1960s, but it was in 1975 that Kodak engineer Stephen Sasson cre created the first ever digital camera. It was built using parts of kits and leftovers around the Kodak factory and an early CCD image sensor from Fairchild in 1974. The camera was about the size of a red box and it took 23 seconds for, to capture a single image. <laughs> the camera weighed eight pounds, which is about 3.6 kilograms, and it recorded black and white images to a compact cassette tape, uh, which had a resolution of, of 0 0.01 megapixels, or 10,000 pixels. And as I said, it took 23 seconds to capture the, the first image, which was taken on the, in December 1975. They began to appear in the market during the last decade of the 20th century, with the first digital camera to go on sale be, uh, being the Daikon Model 1. The quality of the images produced by these first commercially available cameras was the limiting factor, with the images being captured by an integrated lens and a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels. As digital cameras developed, permitting the use of specialized lenses using the single lens, lens reflex systems of analog cameras, the image quality improved. The first of this type was the Hasselblad DB4000 with the digital sensors attached in a leaf black back which fitted in place of the film cartridge or magazine in the back of the camera. And this resulted in photographs that were 2048 by 2048 pixels. And by 2012, the Nikon D800 had provided a 36.3 megapixel full frame sensor with the Nikon D800E. These are considered to surpass the images obtained with a 35 millimeter film and almost on a par with medium format. An increase in the number of autofocus points has improved particularly in the, uh, in the ability to track moving subjects and has been ideal for photographing birds in flight. The capacity for rapid shooting reflected in the increase in frames per second from six frames per second for up to nine consecutive shots in the D1X to a staggering 14 frames per second in the D5 and a dramatic increase in the ISO, the equivalent of film speed uh, in 35 millimeter cameras from a maximum of, of ISO 800 in the D1X to up to ISO 102,400 in the D5. And this has permitted the use of these cameras in very, very low light conditions, thus allowing for, the, for light conditions where birds are usually photographed. And the improvement in the quality of the camera sensors has also meant that for the equivalent ISO, the later cameras produce clearer images with less grain. The cameras became full frame for the first time with the D3 range, and this added to the increase in the output image size. However, and there's always this however, isn't there? As the size of the sensors and therefore the images increased, the file sizes that were produced also got bigger, which raised a problem with the speed at which they could be recorded onto the memory card. In this sense, the camera's shooting rates were ahead of their ability to record the images in the memory cards. So by using a built-in buffer, it was possible for the camera to shoot in rapid succession and the buffer would allow the image files to be recorded at a slightly slower speed than the shutter could shoot. But obviously this wasn't a satisfactory solution. Another option was for the size of the image to be sacrificed in favor of the speed in which the images could be recorded. And this is clearly seen by, the, by comparing the D3X model with the later D4S. The latter, which was designed for speed, actually produces smaller images than the older model. The D800E was uh, released precisely to produce large image sizes, 
but this was at the expense of the shooting speed. So it's, it's, um, it's one or the other, but you can't have both. The problem for the compromise between speed and output size is evident from the fact that Nikon never produced an X model in the D4 range. The jump to the new D5 has partially solved this by increasing speed and file size when compared to the D4S. But interestingly, the file size remains smaller. I'll go on to... Okay. One last issue, and I think most of you will have uh, grappled with this at some point, is that with the improved technology, the size and weight of the cameras got higher. And weight is always a major consideration when planning projects and field trips. However, mirrorless cameras are further changing this scenario and allowing fast, for faster shutter speeds for large images. And one such uh, set of cameras are the Sony Alpha range um, and the Nikon Z series, series. These cameras are much lighter and are also quieter, which is helpful when working with wildlife and the race for better and more efficient instruments keeps the options coming. And you can see here the difference in weights in between these two cameras. Until the arrival of digital cameras, the captured images had to be developed before being viewed. And as we said, there could be quite a lengthy delay between one and the other. The images recorded by the digital cameras were stored in electronic format and could be viewed on a computer screen. But of course, even before that, if you look at, if you talk to any young person, um, and I see it with my own grandchildren, when you take a picture, they immediately want to see the back of your camera because you've got the little viewfinder where you can actually see the picture you've just taken. But that was impossible a few years ago. While the development of computer printers could reproduce printed copies of the images, uh, much like any other photographs we're used to uh, from before, it wasn't, necessary to do that anymore um, and you could look at your uh, pictures on your computer and more to the point you could store those pictures without even having looked at them um, and only selecting a choice few and keeping the others late for later um, as a result once the initial costs of equipment was covered the cost of capture and processing of the images was drastically reduced and it was now possible to take any number of photographs, so long as there was enough power to run your, run your cameras and storage for the photographs. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and let's come back. I, I tend to digress whenever I start talking about anything. So let's, let's come back onto the subject and take up the story again. So back in 1968, the growing fears of the loss of habitat and extinction of rare species the number of people concerned with this question continued to grow. A letter published in the journal IBIS, the journal of the British Ornithologists' Union, um, by Alan et al., was signed by no fewer than 25 notable scientists of the day, including people like Bill Bourne, Peter Evans, James Ferguson Lee, Eric Hoskins, Julian Huxley, Chris Mead, Guy Mumford, and Peter Scott. And they raised the issue of killing birds for identification and research purposes, especially when there were other equally reliable methods available. Of the two cases cited in the letter, their main concern was with regards to a photograph of a white rump swift. Appus Kaffer, that had been published in a previous edition of the journal. The authors of that earlier communication had questioned whether it was of the species Appus affinis or Appus Kaffer, which had until then not been reported north of the Sahara, to which their concluding remarks had been to urge the collection of specimens to determine what species of white rump swifts really do breed in Spain. I'm going to read out of this, if I may, if you permit me. So Alan et al. called on the BOU and the editor of the IBIS to use, and I'm quoting them, their influence to prevent any deterioration in the conservation situation in countries where it is already bad. 
The editor and the council noted on behalf of the BOU that they were opposed to the thoughtless collection of birds on the part of its members. So already the debate was in full flow. And it didn't end there. When the question was raised with regard to, bird, to a bird that had been collected 500 miles north of the species breeding range and 150 miles north of any previous record for North America, asking if it was still necessary to kill a bird for species identification for a statistic for one printed page, vociferous and at times rather vicious, I would say, comments were drawn from both sides of the argument, accusing the author of being misleading and demonstrably anti-scientific. The objections raised about the reliability of observations in the field was rejected by those who responded that these arguments were casting doubts on the work of highly respected bodies such as the United Kingdom's British Birds Rarities Committee and the Records Committee of the BOU. While photographs of a specimen taken in the wild could be useful at times in identifying the species, the difficulty in obtaining a good photograph with the required resolution put in doubt the value of these for the purpose of identifying ra rarities. So photography at this stage was still not able to provide a dependable means of reliably identifying rare birds. With the equipment available, there was also always the issue of the authenticity of the photographs and whether these, or the subject being photographed, might have been in any way tampered with. For example, Snyder et al. evaluated a film that had been presented to the American Ornithologists Union in 1969, claiming to show live Carolina parakeets, Carnaropsis carolinensis, and which now is considered to be likely to have been artificially dyed parakeets, made to look like the rare species. Clearly, if the specimens would have been available for analysis, dead or alive, this argument could easily have been finally settled. So the debate continued, at times becoming heated and acrimonious. Um, and the issue was dealt with um, objectively too by some um, advocating the need of biologists to air their ethical view and incorporate more explicit discussions of ethical methods when, while others wish to continue to separate ethics from science, arguing that the issue was from the perspective of research scientists not engaging in an ethical debate, and as such, providing the, collection, the collecting was carried out under very strict, strict controls, it would be justifiable for museum collections. So to what degree can digital photography really substitute the classic method of collection in the 21st century? Well, I would say what we need to do is try and discuss what the advantages and disadvantages of digital photography might be. So in no particular order, and I say that very sort of intentionally, let's look at the different uh, arguments. So the first one would be in the field of taxonomy in the, and skin collections. Um, skin collections in museums should readily provide the necessary information to classify each specimen at species level. And in most cases, it might be possible to allocate specimens to lower taxonomic ranks, for example, subspecies. Birds are generally easily identifiable on plumage, and studying a detailed digital photograph is not that different from hand handling a skin. Even difficult cases involving very sim similar species, they, these may still be separated using digital photography. There is therefore very little that classical or classic specimen collecting can do, which digital photography cannot do as well. And you have here an example of the juvenile Ordwan's gull on the left and the yellow-legged gull on the right, photographed under similar light conditions at Europa Point. The photographs show how subtle plumage features are picked up with digital photography to separate very similar uh, species. So that's one. Another example is the use of skin collections to identify different phases of um, the animal, to identify the, the age of the animal. So in this first picture, uh, what you have is a 
a second summer, uh, sorry, second summer, it's its third year. And uh, you can see that, if I show you there, that three of its primaries have been molted and they're now showing slightly older uh, light colored gray color. Um, and the third primary, in fact, is only half grown and you can see that clearly from the digital photograph. The next individual is a third summer bird up to the fifth primary is now gray and the trailing edge, and the previous one, as you see it there, the trailing edge of the wing, that's gone in this one. And you can tell that it's not a full adult as the outer primary coverts are not yet gray. So this is just from two simple photographs. And this, sorry, am I? Okay, sorry. So the next point is genetics. Um, the use of genetic analysis in taxidermy of birds has revolutionized our understanding of avian phylogeny. This work has largely involved the capture and release of birds, but there's no doubt that the sampling of museum skins from old collections has made a contribution to this work. A number of examples have been cited by many authors, um, and I'm sure you can uh, think of reasons yourselves. But museums' collections have been used in the identification of cryptic species from specimens both in the field and in the museum collections. Um, so their role as repositories of biological material for DNA and other studies, such as public health, environmental change, among others, has to be recognized. And given that the gathering of sufficiently large museum collections only from specimens found already dead would be slow, if not impossible, there are some roles for museum collections that cannot be replaced, and these collections are still important. Um, why is that move forward? Sorry. Here we go. Dissection. In some instances, and rarely in birds, um, dissection and inspection of the gonads is required for further verification. So there's no doubt that alternative sampling techniques um, have been associated with the risk to the specimen. So taking, for example, taking blood from a bird can actually result in casualties. Uh, so increasing the mortality um, with the capture and subsequent release. And this cannot be ignored. However, the argument has been made for the use of other techniques so as to minimize as far as possible the need to kill the specimens. And these include the collection of blood, like I've just said, or other um, samples such as feathers or skin or hair, if it's um, a mammal, um, from which DNA can be obtained. And the assertion that the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature should be amended to require that a position of a dead voucher-type specimen of new species and subspecies has and argued that where there are cases that may not be necessary for the collection of type specimens, especially in the case of rare and endangered species. Digital photography has allowed for a greater number of digital specimens to be collected and processed quickly than the classical method could ever have done. So that has to be seen in favor of the digital photography. And addition, this additionally permits the analysis of, for example, seasonal patterns of aging and sex ratios in particular locations between different sites, thus adding to the wealth of information contained in the digital collection. So sample size is something else that you have to take into consideration. And unless you've got a, a, a very large museum which is very well funded, this is usually very difficult. Digital photography also allows for a greater number of, of specimens to be collected and processed quickly um, than the classical method would ever be, uh, have done. And this is additionally permits analysis of, for example, seasonal patterns of aging and sex ratios in particular locations or between different sites. And in this case, we can see the Craig Martin, and this is a project that we're involved with in the museum with the Botanical Gardens and the Ornithological Society in Gibraltar, where we're looking at the Craig Martins and doing a study on their tail spots. And that's a, a view of of us processing the, <laughs> the work. Okay, 
Molt patterns. So the study of molt patterns from, muse from museum skins may have limited value because the number of specimens covering different times of the year from a single locality is unlikely to be of sufficient numbers to allow statistical analysis. So this is another advance that, uh, sorry, advantage that digital photography can provide. And the degree of resolution um, might have been an issue, but if you're able to process a lot of animals, then that, that helps. Behavior, well, the study of um, behavior is now possible because of the number of digital photographs that it's possible to take. Um, and so ringing uh, of birds and tagging them uh, means that photography can allow us to take photographs of these birds in the field and then later look closely at the tags or the rings and actually see them from the photograph. Something which would have been impossible when the resolution of the photograph wasn't as clear as it is today. Storage and resources, we've mentioned already the, the, the fact that if you're going to have a reasonable collection of skins, then you have to have the resources and, um, and the, the, the building for, for it to house the, the storage of the skins. And then the skins have to be curated and cared for so that they don't deteriorate and, you, you, and avoid losing them. There's no doubt, on the other hand, that classic and authentic specimens offer a wow factor in a museum. So actually having a, the real genuine article on display is important. But nowadays, because photo photography can get a degree of resolution that we weren't able to get before, um, and with the moving technology and 3D printouts and that sort of thing, then you can provide very authentic looking reproductions and avoid the need to use um, mounted uh, taxidermy. And then, of course, there's accessibility. If you're going to go and study the skins, you have to physically travel to wherever it is that the repository of those skins is found. Whereas if you've got a digital collection, you can share that collection with any number of students or researchers at any one time. And so the collection becomes much more uh, accessible even if you're not in the same country or even in the same continent. So while there's, the issue has evidently not been resolved satisfactorily and there's definitely cases where there are advantages and disadvantages that are never going to be fully um, addressed, um, there are more avail uh, alternatives available now for the amassing of information on specimens in the field which would have without having to kill the, the animal uh, concerned or to unduly disturb the animal. As I said earlier, this isn't a 21st century question. It's not even a 20th century question. As I said at the beginning, the potential of photography as a scientific tool was recognized very early on, very, very early on. And some of the naturalists in the late 19th and early 20th century also made efforts in their publications to record some of the activities through the, the new medium of photography, even though portability of equipment was an evident challenge. And there are accounts of natural history um, of nat naturalists in the Gibraltar in unpublished diaries and letters held by the museum. And several books written by collectors who either used Gibraltar as a base or who were based here in the course of their careers and some of these authors, uh, Mullins, Chapman and Buck, Irby and Guy Monfort, give at best very brief accounts of their methods and equipments. Fortunately, a detailed description is provided by the late 19th century and early 20th century naturalist who I mentioned earlier, Lieutenant Colonel William Willoughby Cole Werner. And he wrote in detail about his ornithological activities while based in Gibraltar. His accounts have provided material for comparison of the methods that were used then to those today. And that's what I'm going to look at now, very briefly. Come on, go there. Fortunately, a detailed description is provided by him um, in one of his books. And I've used that as the, the means of comparison. The first thing that Werner advises is that to properly study wild birds, the most important consideration is time, something which holds true even today. Without ample and adequate time, little would be achieved. 
Unlike in today's world of motor vehicles, in his day, fieldwork involved expeditions into the countryside on horseback, requiring careful planning of equipment and supporting resources. The same territory which Werner covered during his longer expeditions, which lasted more than a day, can be done today in a fraction of the time, and many of his sites are within a day's drive from Gibraltar. Modern 4x4 vehicles also allow for the transportation of much more equipment, should it be needed, with much less effort. So on the left of the image, you've got a 4x4 vehicle which we used in the Pyrenees, and uh, this is Werner on the back of the rock when he's been going by foot. And this is him with, well, with his servant with a pack horse with his traveling kit. Werner describes these difficulties in typically eloquent form. He says, at no period was this, the time factor, more clearly brought home to me than during my six years at Gibraltar between 1874 and 1880. That was in the days when no railways or other facilities for travel existed in the vicinity, for even the road from Algeciras to Tarifa was not then constructed. Hence, every expedition from the rock was limited to riding out between the hours of morning and evening gunfire, when the gates of the fortress were opened and closed. And closed they indeed were, and the keys were taken to the convent for the governor's residence and kept there. Every expedition thus depended on its powers of one's horse to carry one far enough afield at sufficient speed to leave reasonable time for the sport of ornithology. One result was that one became a past master in the art of packing one's kit on horseback for guns, food, ammunition, ropes for climbing, and all paraphernalia of the naturalist had to be thus carried. So that's him fully kitted out for climbing. It's interesting to find parallels between Werner's planning of expeditions and that done today by the Gibraltar National Museum's photographers. The limitations described by Werner are reminiscent to, of the problems faced by the natural photographer today. Indeed, wherever possible, Werner's advice to plan for all eventualities is just as applicable today with digital photography expeditions as they were in his day. And he writes, from time to time, it was possible to get a few days leave, generally five to 10 days. And then pack animals were called into requisition to carry our supplies and equipment. My own experience was that unless a promising expedition was to run the risk of being wrecked for want of bare comforts of life, the only sure way to achieve success was to look upon bird nesting expeditions in a wild country much as a campaign and to prepare accordingly for every possible eventuality. So we don't have time to go into the full details, I'm afraid, we're doing all right. But um, let's see some of the photographic apparatus which was most relevant. Um, he wrote at a time when sketching and watercolors were very much part of military training and um, by far the most important part of recording of the countryside. It was still the preferred mode of recording as Werner clearly admits, and he writes, inadequate and crude as many of these sketches are, they give an idea no camera work can pretend to the heights and distances, atmosphere and color amid which my beloved birds live. And he went to great lengths to take photographs. And that's a close-up of him taking a photograph of, the, of a nest. Sorry? Uh, yes. In his book, um, he includes a chapter dedicated to the cranes in Lahanda, uh, a, a body of marshland very close to Gibraltar, which has since been drained. And in, the only photographs ever taken of a crane in that wetland was published by him. And this is a close-up of the eggs, showing the relative position of the two eggs and the inclination of, the, of larger di diameters, size four inches by 2.5 inches. Here we also see the efforts required to take a photograph of a rather inaccessible nest on a cliff. <laughs> so, I mean, he was, he was quite a man. So what of the camera equipment itself? I think we're going to skip that because I'm running out of time, but um, the lessons continue with a remote, which 
with remarks that show the great insight into field photography, which are just as applicable today. And he says, there is, of course, no finality in the marvelous advances in science, and every year we'll see better lenses and more perfect appliances placed at the use of this field naturalist. But there are distinct limits which are not set by the degree of perfection of the camera employed, but by the knowledge, energy, persistence, skill, and above all, the nerve of the individual who employs it. And that is the point I really wanted to make, because just because you've I can afford to buy a camera, maybe a really good quality camera, just because I can afford to rent a, a guide to take me to an inaccessible nest, that doesn't make me a naturalist and that does not make me a wildlife photographer. It makes me a photographer who takes wildlife photographs. And this is very important. And this is, I think, very well in illustrated in this cartoon. Um, there are a lot of people going around disturbing animals, disturbing animals in nests. Um, there are codes of ethics that the photographer has to employ which are not known by people who just go buy a camera off the shelf and think themselves to be a wildlife photographer. So there is a responsibility that gets built into. And I think this is part of the argument about the ethics of collecting. Just because you can collect doesn't mean you should collect, whether you're killing the animal or just taking a photograph of it. This is some of the wildlife photographs taken out there. I've deliberately taken one, uh, showing you one that is not taken in Europe. These are some of the cameras that Werner used in his day. And I think the next illustration shows you the limitations of those cameras. This is, a, I mean, he, he wasn't pleased with this photograph, but this is the kind of photograph that he could, own, the only kind of photograph he could take of a flying bird. And Unfortunately, he was limited in many occasions to collecting, in this case, a, a bustard, a great bustard. So perhaps it's a small wonder that the practice of hunting and collecting of, the, of specimens by shooting was the only practical way of studying uh, specimens. But we mustn't fall into the trap of seeing those, these naturalists as wanton killers of animals, but see them instead in the context of their day. This was the way of collecting formation and building up museum collections then. Werner, whom we've used to guide us throughout this period, was very clear with regards what, of what ought and ought not to be done. So, conclusions. I think we've been able to look very briefly, I accept, on the advantages and disadvantages of digital photography. But I think if there's a take-home message at the end of this talk, it has to be that while there, were, there may still be, even today, possible exceptions which will justify the killing of an animal as a scientific specimen, I think digital photography gives us just as much information, and in some cases, more information than the actual killing of the animal. So I think it should only be in really extreme circumstances and only by the really large organizations and institutions that have dedicated their collections to the really um, e complete, for, I'm thinking in terms of the Natural History Museum in London, where you've got the collections of, of skins and um, many type specimens are contained there. But for the smaller museums, such as, for example, the Gibraltar National Museum, we can still hold a very important collection, but in, the terms, in terms of digital photography and not in, life, in specimens taken from life. And just as a final thought, which I thought was amazing, really has very little to do with this talk, I'd just like to share with you a thought. According to Alison Marsh, professor at the University of South Carolina, who she's calculated that we will, as a planet, collectively take 1.4 trillion photographs this year. By a trillion, she's American, she means 1,000 thousand millions, or 10 to the 12th power, or 1.4 followed by 11 zeros. So to try and get that into some perspective, and I don't know if you can, I certainly can't, um, on a good night, we look up into the sky, you might be lucky to see between 2,500 and 5,000 stars. We're talking of <laughs> that 1.4 trillion photographs. 
Anyway, just a thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geraldine. That was a very, very interesting talk. Uh, we're quite short on time, but there's one uh, question that's come in via YouTube. So if I ask you that one and you answer that one, and if anyone in the uh, room has any to ask, we'll, we'll save them for the discussion afterwards. Yeah? Okay. We, right, okay. So this is from Natalie Wilson via YouTube. And she writes, Hi Geraldine, now that we can see our photographs immediately rather than waiting for film to be processed, do you feel that we've lost some of the excitement of nature photography? I think probably, possibly, but I think nature photography is exciting in itself. You know, I haven't been able to touch on this, but there is nothing more exciting than sitting, waiting, planning a photograph first, and then sitting and waiting to see if it happens. Uh, nature, by its very nature, pardon the pun, uh, cannot really be controlled, and so it's exciting enough. And honestly, having lived through the time when, as a poor student, um, I really had to take the decision whether or not I was going to change the film in my camera, and I could only afford one camera. Um, and take the decision, shall I waste the last two exposures because what if the next photograph comes along? Really, um, I can do with that, uh, without that kind of excitement. Nature photography by its nature is exciting. Okay. A, a quick, quick one, yes, go on. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, Keith Bensus and Gibraltar Botanic Gardens. I'd just like to say something quickly before, before the next two talks because it's important to highlight, I think. It's, it's that, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jerry, for, for a really, uh, really useful and interesting talk with, with a really good historic angle. Um, the, the arguments that you make about, about the collection of specimens, um, absolutely right and very well deployed, but those arguments apply to birds and to, and, yes. and, and to vertebrates more widely. And, and invertebrates, which still constitute the vast majority of life on Earth, still have to be collected in, in order to be identified. And I just thought I would make that point before the next two talks, because people are going to spend the next two hours Showing. seeing photographs <laughs> of mounted specimens. It, it's, <laughs> that's a very valid point. Yeah. I did sort of say it at the beginning, that I was focusing on birds. I can see that, but at the same time, I just wanted to be careful that because I didn't really have time to, to talk too much about that, I didn't want to be accused of not considering insects and invertebrates to have as much right to life as vertebrates. Mm, but I, I totally accept that the, it'll be different. And, and in fact, though, those arguments have shifted now to the larger invertebrates that yeah. can be identified in the field. Yeah. 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 Can, can I say that um, that very discussion, uh, that very point is one that I had down for the discussion at, at uh, six o'clock at the end we'll of the session that, because it's one that's very uh, topical in natural history or in scientific research taxonomy and so on as regard where you can go in relation to collecting specimens DNA collection and so on. I think it's one that we can develop a, a little bit at the end, especially after the talks that you'll be giving, which will... So, we'll... Thank you very much, Geraldine. That was an excellent talk.